Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, everyone. Today, Deb and I are going to be talking about the myth of Prometheus, particularly this complicated tension between foresight and hindsight, the way that human beings can reach into this creative stratosphere and bring down from some mysterious place inside of themselves or perhaps from the collective unconscious, knowledge, wisdom, capacity, insights, discoveries, and sometimes wisely implement them and sometimes create disastrous results. The myth of Prometheus gives us a window into that tension and affords us some mythic metaphors to consider how complicated it is to bring to fruit some of the remarkable things that we can discover. We'll talk a little bit about Frankenstein. We have a wonderful dream that centers around an eagle, part of the Promethean myth. And we hope that you'll listen right until the end. I am really glad that today we are going to engage with Prometheus uh, because he's been a, a kind of a lifelong on and off interest. Uh, when I was a child and there was, we didn't have a TV or anything, I went to the library and I had a book of uh, Greek myths written for children. And I saw the picture of Prometheus. Uh, it was pretty vivid. He was chained to a rock, and there was this big bird and eagle coming down, ready to dive bomb his side. And I read the story about how uh, he had stolen fire and given it to humans, and that he was punished for this by Zeus. And I remember going around and asking adult after adult, you know, what was so bad about stealing fire and why wouldn't Zeus want people to have it so they could cook their food? And uh, I remember sort of um, indulgent smiles from adults like, um, you know, that's that's such a cute question from from this cute kid and then no answer. So today, I hope we'll unravel who Prometheus was, what he stands for, and what it's all about. So I'll just keep going here and, and kind of lay the groundwork sure. uh, for the basic storyline. Um, Prometheus was a kind of a, a trickster, and he's been called the friend of mankind. And the, the tale starts out uh, with his offering the gods a sacrificial meal. So a bull was sacrificed, and what Prometheus did was he wrapped up all the bones and covered them in appealing, uh, glistening fat, which would be really yummy. And then he took the meaty parts and put them uh, in the stomach of, of an ox, I think. So it looked gross. So the good stuff is hidden uh, inside an unappealing exterior, and the inedible stuff is, is underneath what looks like an appealing offering. So um, the gods were told they could pick whichever one of the two offerings they wanted, and they picked the one that looked good on the outside but just had bones on the inside. 
So this was um, uh, something that irritated the gods, but it also laid the groundwork for human sacrifice to the gods of animals forever after, that it was okay to keep the meat for the human community and just give the gods the bones that legitimized it. And uh, not to be, uh, because Zeus was angry about this, he withheld fire from human beings. It's like, okay, then that's it. No fire for you guys. At which point, Prometheus steals fire and and gives it to human beings. Uh, now Prometheus is really punished by Zeus, and that takes us back to that picture that I still remember from my long-ago library book of this poor man chained to a rock uh, with an eagle about to dive bomb into his side. So is Prometheus the champion of mankind? Uh, or is he a trickster? Is he devious? Did he betray um, his Olympian community? Uh, or is he both? Well, <clears throat> I think that it, it's a wonderful thing that myths are so broad <laughs> and that we can use them as interesting metaphors <laughs> To, uh, to illuminate mm -hmm. you know, any number of things. I think that there are um, different tellings of all the myths, which is just part of the scholarship. Mm -hmm. One of the things that seems important relative to Prometheus's motivations is that Prometheus and his brother Epimetheus were tasked with populating the earth that uh, Epimetheus mm. created all the animals, and Zeus had given him a bunch of capacities that he could distribute around the animals. And Epimetheus had this wonderful time giving wings and talons and scales mm. and abilities to swim and fly and do a bunch <laughs> of things running 45 miles an hour. And by the time it was done, you know, everybody was amazed, this incredible variety of stuff. And then it's Prometheus's term, uh, time, and uh, Zeus says, okay, well, can, you know, why don't you make humanity? And after he makes mm -hmm. humanity, there's nothing left. So, <laughs> so we're, we were left in the beginning with none of these extraordinary potencies that no animals claws, had. No wings. That's mm -hmm. right. No, can't go underwater and breathe. Um, ah. And yet... Because we are made from Prometheus, he has this great affinity, as in many stories, the creator and the created have this deep affinity. And mm. so Prometheus um, beholds that human beings are suffering mightily. They are preyed upon by the animals, and they're, they have no civilization. And so a no few fur. things. No fur. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that are attributed to Prometheus is that he is said to have gone among human beings and given them wisdom, which is the thing mm -hmm. that Epimetheus didn't give the animals. That he couldn't make them run 45 miles an hour, but he could try to make them wise. Mm. And which is such an interesting uh, piece of consideration. Mm -hmm. Because they become wise, uh, Zeus also is very um, uh, ambivalent about them and isn't really sure how powerful they should become. Your story about the sacrifices is that it's one of the th things that uh, Prometheus promises the Olympians and, and says, well, they're good for one thing. Let's not just, you know, wipe them <laughs> off like gnats. Right. You know, they're good for something. And, you know, they can kill the animals. And since the Olympic gods couldn't eat meat, that they would dine on the smoke. Mm -hmm. So that was his promise. <laughs> He's like, this is what they're good for. 
So the humans begin to do that, and they're able to curry favor by sacrificing. This seems very important to me because Prometheus is the god who sacrifices himself in order to give them fire, that he himself is put Mm. on a rock and shredded apart by an eagle in order to satisfy the Olympians. And there's a foreshadowing of that when he promises that humanity will also Mm -hmm. sacrifice all number of things and that the gods will really like that. They'll think it's really great. Although I'm never, I've never been sure whether Prometheus thought he would just get away with it or whether it was an intentional uh, sacrifice. Um, But he brings down something that is of the gods and gives it to mankind. And so that, you know, that takes me into what is fire? Right. And uh, how, what a huge step that must have been. Can you imagine, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago where, um, men, humans didn't know how to make fire. And I, I'm sure they could use what was left from lightning strikes and try to, you know, keep all the embers burning. But, uh, uh, you know, f- fire is how we, you know, keep the cave warm, how we, how we cook our food. Um, it's instrumental in, uh, building civilization, really, culture and art, because I'm thinking about internal fire, the fire of passion or mm-hmm. the fires of creativity, uh, you know, all the metaphors that we have where we say that somebody's just on fire with, with their project uh, or something lit a spark. Uh, so uh, it, it's so symbolic and so important that it was fire uh, that human beings needed, and and that that is what Prometheus brought them. That that the control of fire gave them mastery mm. over so many things. Animals yes, exactly. in general are frightened of fire. They might not be frightened of human beings, mm-hmm. but you know, a, a flaming log. You know, being tossed yeah. towards an animal is going to make it run away for sure. Yeah. And, and animals is... will not approach a fire. If you have, right. you know, all the stories we've all read about, you have to light a fire and sleep around the fire if you're out in the open right. uh, as protection. Exactly. And warmth. And warmth. So there's a way to yeah. control the environment. There's a way mm-hmm. to transform things that are inedible. And by cooking things, it makes them more hmm. edible and more digestible and, and allows yeah, I, humans I, to extract more nutrition than they could by eating everything raw. Absolutely. I mean, the prospect of eating raw zebra is decidedly unappetizing. Absolutely. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but as you said, that the, fire is the first, first step of alchemy, that if you can't Heat ah, that's things, right. You can't combine them. That two cold metals just clanging yeah. against each other are just two cold metals. Yeah. But that fire, which is the, the softening element, mm-hmm. fire also transforms objects into heat and light. It is the great transformative mir- miracle. Mm-hmm. Allows things to change. It it really does, and it, I think it is everywhere uh, there is a fire god. I think that is a very a universal uh, deity. I know there there's um, Agni in Hinduism and all kinds of gods of fire uh, because it is powerful and transformative and destructive. It's that same ambiguity that Prometheus himself uh, possesses as part of his nature. 
of how are we going to use the fire? Right. And uncontrolled fire. You know, last year we saw this horrible wildfire sweeping through Australia. Mm-hmm. Just as you said, uncontained oh, yes. fire uh, is terrifying. Yeah. And Hawaii as well. So mastering fire gives us all these wonderful things like a, a stove and you know mm-hmm. uh, hot water. But uncontrolled fire is something we can only be subject to. And I'm taking it back inside uh, the, our own uh, instinctive fires. Of uh, are we on fire with an idea for a great new project? Uh, to you know, with our own hands, um, you know, build something. Let's say. Or are we on fire with urges and instincts and desires that might better be brought under control? Uh, what do we do with our own inner fire of desires, instincts? Um, and, and I could relate that to, I mean, it's not hard to, by extension, think of uh, people that are in the throes of, let's say, addiction. Mm-hmm. That uh, those, the fire within is for something that is essentially, you know, not in the service of of growth and development and individuation. So we all ha- we all have an inner battle. Uh, with our inner fire, uh, do we have it or does it have us? Undoubtedly. And the harnessing of fire is the beginning of analysis in terms of private work. Mm. That looking at a troubling personality trait, let's say, and just expecting uh, ourselves or our analysands to constrain it, to reflect on it rather than to mm-hmm. act it out in the environment, puts mm-hmm. puts the instinct into a kind of furnace. And by telling it that it doesn't mm. get to run around in the environment, it creates heat. And that's what we call frustration. Frustration <laughs> is heat. Yeah. And depending on how we can watch the frustration and how that changes us, that we can discover things that are revealed as the fire burns. And I think that's what you're that's, saying. I really is. like yeah. the image. Yeah. I like the image a lot of um, having it in a furnace. Uh, we once had a wood burning stove. And that's the that's what I'm relating uh, this to. It is amazing how much heat a small wood burning stove can throw off, be- because it's contained. And I can imagine that the pieces of wood we put in there were frustrated. Yes, they were very frustrated. <laughs> they they wanted to just burst into flame and be all over, but. Um, it was it's generative, and I think it's such a great parallel to the internal process, not only in analysis but in life of when we can contain our fire of th- that then it can be useful mm-hmm. rather than just burning things up, being destructive. Sure, and there's some ways that we take this so for granted that you know, let's say we've come through high school and we're naturally talented dancers and then we audition mm-hmm. and we wind up going to a, a ballet school. Well, you are definitely mm-hmm. put into a furnace. Uh, you're not doing wild, exuberant things mm-hmm. that that the basic instinct to dance and move and the connection to the body and all of that kinesthetic gift is subject to this very rigorous structural process which ideally allows the instinct to dance to achieve an artistic height that it, mm. it could not attain without the discipline. 
And then there are the more problematic impulses that are antisocial uh, yeah. causing problems. They have to be frustrated in a different way where something totally new has to emerge because the trajectory mm-hmm. of the fire is just going to is going to be a, a a big problem no matter how we look at it which it goes to your comment about addiction yeah. in one way or another it, mm-hmm. it, and it's child rearing too you know mm-hmm. of i i can remember um somehow it was all the thing back then um when your kids got to a certain age to be able to say usually to a little boy um you know, use your words, use your words. You know, they didn't have all that many words. Uh, so it would come out and like, no, I'm mad. You know, uh, uh, I don't like Susie. And you could see the frustration there. Mm-hmm. But of having to teach kids, you know, pull it in, contain it inside. Uh, your body, in a sense, is the furnace for the inner fire of fury, but you can't hit your sister. Uh, that we're forever in that tension of what our instincts and desires and urges want us to do. You know, I'd like to haul off and clock them versus not a good idea. Um, <laughs> perhaps I could choose some words very carefully to say, I find your behavior very frustrating <laughs> <laughs> and 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 have to contain that inner fury, which is like, mm. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, isn't it forever uh, the story of ego and instincts, urges, desires, passions, emotions of either they have us or we have them. So if we if we move to this idea of um, this more psychological metaphor, <clears throat> and how do we understand our relationship to inner fire, having us or mm-hmm. us having it? So human beings have been made, and they've been made by a titan, mm-hmm. and the titans are these um, ancient ancient earth forces, uh, unimaged in many ways, oceans, winds, Mm -hmm. mountains, unlike the Olympians that are high up on Olympus and they look like perfected human Mm -hmm. beings, eternally youthful and beautiful, and and also seem interested in human domestic activities, gods of war and uh, agriculture. So there are the Olympians up here, there's humanity, you know, in, in the beginning, kind of crawling around on the earth. And then there's a mediator <laughs> between those things. And Prometheus, mm-hmm. I think, represents something inside the human psyche that has one foot in the archetypal world and then one foot in the very physical world. Mm-hmm. Um, you and I had talked before, and that could be a description of the human ego that straddles these two different mm-hmm. places and is able from the archetypal to the psychoid, is able to translate these very archetypal dynamics, perhaps even the realization in early humans that fire could be created, that one didn't have to wait for lightning. I would imagine that that came from some archetypal insight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I like that image of it, um, one foot in the instinctual and one foot in a way in the heavens. Yes. Uh, the gift from the gods. Uh, because it was Zeus that had the control over it and could give permission or not. And then this elemental force, the Titan, snitches it and gives it to people. Right. And I. I can imagine, you know, the question for us is, how do we use it or do we overreach? Uh, Which is what Prometheus did. He overreached in stealing fire from the head of all the Olympians, Zeus, 
and giving it to mankind. And he he paid a terrible price for it, um, chained to this rock and having his liver devoured every day and regrowing every night. And I wonder for us, how do we balance those those forces of the the instinctual or perhaps just uh, selfish, egotistical, uh, desirous? A- and then when might we overreach and wind up like Prometheus on a symbolic rock somewhere uh, be- because we went too far? Well, I think Jung leans into this in a subtle way just to start the conversation that he, he talks a little bit about Prometheus and the Promethean problem. And as Jung's understanding of, of the collective unconscious, mm-hmm. of this enormous storehouse of information and images and insights, that when someone like himself, Jung himself, uh, plums these depths of archetypal and unconscious material and then brings it through, describes it in words. In the Red Book, he makes pictures of it. Hmm. That those ideas and those images, in a sense, act as conduits for archetypal forces that cannot necessarily be controlled. And so the person, the artist, the philosopher, the musician, Mm. the person who is incarnating something that has not been here before Mm -hmm. is then carrying the, the emergent archetypal potential, which Jung observed puts that ego under stress often for the for the entire lifespan and that mm-hmm. the unconscious itself seems to almost punish the artist by constantly leaning mm-hmm. into them either making demands on them giving them overwhelming experiences of feeling and impulses that the collective unconscious which is so much more powerful than the ego now has its hands on the artist and mm-hmm. there are many tragic stories of artists and writers and philosophers. Yes, absolutely. Who couldn't stand the experience, uh, the intensity yeah. of having that hand on the God's fire. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really a, a momentous task, and it is a metaphor one way or another for all of us of uh, what we what we do with the fire uh you know we don't have to be a, a, you know some t- a great poet or musician or something but um we we see the battle writ large in a way as somebody like the life of of Vincent van Gogh for example who was so talented and had such a hard time uh, c- controlling and ma- he the the urges and powers and the inspiration uh, that came to him to create his beautiful famous original uh, works of art. Uh, but you know, I I am thinking of um, what happens. Well. I, when man really overreaches and uh, creates something that he really can't control, that's that's writ even larger. And um, one of the examples of that, the early example that we're all familiar with, uh, is the story of Frankenstein. Oh, yeah. And uh, that there is the Promethean feat of of the creator who was uh, the fictional character is Victor Frankenstein, and he created the creature. And over time, it's, we all refer to him as Frankenstein. But uh, the title of the book, which I hadn't remembered, 
is Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. And uh, the backstory is that Mary Shelley and Lord Byron and uh, the person that she eventually married and a stepsister were, were all vacationing, I think, in, um, in Italy, but at any rate in Europe. Uh, dur during the summer, that never really happened because there had been a huge volcano that exploded in Indonesia, and the volcanic ash uh, created weather disruptions, all kinds of disruptions around the world. And so there they all were in this rented house with nothing to do, and they were all interested in the macabre and in what today we might call sort of sci-fi and they came up with this creative, hey, I know, let's all play a game called Who Can Write the Best Horror Story? Um, I'm sure it was said more eloquently than that. And Mary Shelley, who was basically still a teenager, she was only 19 or 20, uh, wrote, wrote this. And another man who was a physician I think to Lord Byron, who was named John Polidori, wrote a story called The Vampire. And that launched us into that whole um, mythological uh, stream of, of stories. But Victor Frankenstein, the, the protagonist in the story, creates the monster or the creature, and he's he wants, he's grieving his mother's death and he's brilliant and he's a scientist and so on and so forth. And he creates the monster who is about eight feet tall and hideous because it's really not hard. It's really very difficult uh, to create a facsimile of a human being as it turns out. <laughs> and this poor, this poor monster is rejected everywhere he goes People don't like him. He's hideous. He keeps trying to make friends, uh, but people are repulsed by him over and over. Uh, I think I haven't reread the story, but uh, through all these various mishaps and then his own anger and retaliatory uh, actions, eventually he disappears. And um, he's, I think, still roaming around up in the North Pole. So just keep an eye out if you happen to go up into the Arctic Circle, because you never know, the creature might still be, be up there. But with that little facetious aside set aside, uh, there is the example of Promethean power writ large, the, the capability of creating life, and the unanticipated, unwanted consequences of that. And I think we see it all over the place today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there are some wonderful little um, allusions that Mary Shelley mm -hmm. seems to dance back and forth. Mm -hmm. That um, if we think about Zeus being the one who was the uh, possessor of fire, and Zeus was in mm -hmm. control of lightning. And so undoubtedly, the, the right. earliest humans Thunder would have... Yeah, would have seen lightning strike a tree and it would burst into flames. Maybe they would run away. Something Promethean inside of them decides to run over and get a stick and kind of carry it around. <laughs> but the lightning is the thing that holds the fire of life. And in the Frankenstein story, similarly, the inanimate body parts that Victor Frankenstein finds and he sews together are then lit on fire by lightning. Yeah. The fire yeah. of life is put into the wood of Frankenstein. <laughs> and to his own surprise, things come together. I think uh, you and I were talking earlier and you'd mentioned that uh, Victor Frankenstein is interested in alchemy in the beginning of the book. So yeah, we already and, know. Uh, they were... S they were staying near the castle of Frankenstein Castle is where they were 10 or 11, 12 miles away from this castle. And um, 
So anyway, that's uh, no doubt the the origin of the character's name. Uh, And that's right. It takes lightning. It takes a charge to bring the creature to life. So we begin with the, the symbolism that Prometheus may have the best of motives, that he steals fire from Zeus's lightning. He carries it in a, a sheet of um, plants, of leaves, and he bestows it on human beings and teaches them about it, ostensibly to improve human condition. But Prometheus knows that Zeus doesn't want to share this, that this is supposed to be reserved only for mm-hmm. God. And similarly, the young Victor Frankenstein you know, has his eyes on lightning, has his eyes mm-hmm. on the capacity to make life. And in his experimentations, he too steals the secret of making life from from the divine and then has Mm -hmm. to suffer a consequence. One of the things that is part of the Frankenstein myth is that when Frankenstein finally comes to life and is rather uh, childlike and, and sweet and totally innocent, but is grotesque to look at, and Victor abandons him. Mm-hmm. He just runs away. He, does, he doesn't want to be responsible for this enormous mm-hmm. event that he has set in motion. And the creature, the Frankenstein monster, is is wounded over and over and over again yeah. by having no protection, uh, no help, no guidance. And so finally seeks vengeance upon his maker for the suffering that has been visited upon him by being abandoned. There there are so many other examples of these unintended and sort of disastrous uh, consequences of, uh, you know, it's, it is the prerogative of the gods uh, to have to have fire, and might we is it the prerogative of the gods uh, to create life? Uh, it has been mythically, but these days we can clone a sheep. Wasn't there mm-hmm. a sheep named Dolly that That's right. was cloned that in an exact genetic replica of whoever Dolly's uh, progenitor was? Yes. Um, we we have Promethean powers here. We have indeed become godlike. And what might be the unintended consequences of, of that? And as you mentioned before, that Prometheus, the name means forethought, and his brother, Epimetheus, means afterthought. And I wonder, are we Promethean in the sense that we're we're just thinking about what we can do rather than, uh-oh, let's reflect on this before we've done it. Let, right, let's look before we leap. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So the, mm-hmm. the great modern example of this is Oppenheimer and his <gasps> right. contribution to the creation of nuclear weapons, or rather... His discovery of how to master nuclear yeah. fusion, how to operationalize that, which then is yeah. co-opted to these military purposes. So we have this genius who, in a sense, has one foot in the realm of the gods and one mm-hmm. foot in the material world and is able to translate these, these um, insights, instincts, these intuitions about what's possible mm-hmm. and and work out the formula to 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 break the atom and to set a fire mm-hmm. free mm-hmm. in this world and to give it to humanity which at first I'm sure seemed miraculous although when Oppenheimer saw the first nuclear detonation is had famously taken a line from the Bhagavad Gita, 
Hmm. and says, I am become the destroyer of worlds. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and yet he willingly, uh, purposefully created the atom bomb as a weapon. Uh, they, they built a whole town in, in New Mexico for, in order to uh, fund and, and have all the resources necessary to create this project. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know, you know, Jung said something to the effect that, you know, for human beings to have the atom bomb was like giving guns to five-year-olds or some, something along that line. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is Promethean. Of we Have we overreached? And uh, we'll wind up... Uh, as with the consequences of of a self-destructive creation, that our creations will destroy us. And the new villain on the horizon, I think, is is AI. Uh, it'll take over. So, well, just thinking about the arc of the Oppenheimer's moment is then all of a sudden the creatures, which are nuclear weapons, proliferate. And now mm. they're, they're pointing at their creator from various other nation yeah. states. That, yes. um, that, that there is this threat of the monsters coming home and demanding a reckoning for having been brought to life. And particularly... Mm. Victor Frankenstein abandons his creations. And in a sense, Mm -hmm. we can imagine that uh, the secret of nuclear fission is kind of sent out into the world, was not tended properly, was not kept close and watched in the way that you would a child, in the way you might be responsible Mm -hmm. for something you've created. And now it's... all over the place in all these kind of different ways. Now, I also want to say on the upside, uh, right. nuclear reactors could offer, <laughs> as the technology continues to improve, could offer a remarkable solution to the energy crisis. Um, I have friends who are nuclear engineers. Uh, they're very clear that that is the path of the future, that oh. that is the only option that is truly viable and because people hmm. have become so frightened of nuclear weaponry and can only see the monstrous side of it that they've lost sight of Prometheus's gift of fire to humanity that it was hmm. also a gift and that human civilization was improved by the fire even though Prometheus suffered at great cost to bestow that, I, um, I, I still wonder. You know, what does it take to really tend these powers? Because um, you can build Chernobyl and not tend it well enough, and there's a horrible nuclear accident. So when we take these powers into our own hands, uh, it's a big deal, and I think it may be forever ambiguous that there's both a plus and a minus every time. Of Yes, there's a nuclear power plant that can deliver energy to some countless number of homes, and it's clean, and it doesn't produce waste, and things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, The tsunami that flooded uh, the nuclear plant in Japan, uh, there are still consequences from that. And in the States, we had Three Mile Island. So uh, I'm not thinking there's a right, wrong, good, bad, but just how do we hold both 
uh, of the possibilities. And I think the myth uh, that it is inherently mm-hmm. ambiguous. And I think the myth actually helps us because there's Prometheus who is forethought and Epimetheus who is hindsight. And as often is in mythology, brothers often represent ego mm-hmm. and shadow. Mm-hmm. Prometheus uh, and the worship of Prometheus was connected to prophecy because Prometheus had a sense of what is going to happen down the line. And in Mm. that regard, it is quite possible that Prometheus was fully aware that he would pay a a terrible price, but that he would pay the price on behalf of humanity. So humanity would get Mm. the, the benefits of fire, but Prometheus would in some way be eternally punished for it. And this leans into the Judeo-Christian stories and other stories of the sacrificed gods who suffers on behalf of humanity, but suffering there must be. A sense that it's a price that is predicted. Epimetheus is more impulsive. He uses up all the gifts for the animals Mm -hmm. and has no sense, oh, look, there's nothing in the bank, but boy, look at those animals, they're great. (laughs) So... The Olympians are pretty angry about how much has been given to humanity, and they're, they really they're, they still want some punishment going on. And so the Olympians take mud again and craft the perfect woman, Pandora. Mm-hmm. Athena puts jade in her eyes and breathes life into her, and she is he, she is the most perfect of all women, and they're going to give her to Epimetheus. But before she leaves Olympus, they're giving her a little box. And the Olympians have put every form of human evil and suffering in the box. (laughs) And they seal it all up, and they just say to her, you know, Oh, you're going to have a great time. Don't open that box, whatever Uh you do. And Uh they give her this gift and curse of curiosity, which brings us back to Oppenheimer. That Mm. there is something in the human spirit about curiosity and the need to know that is part of the story. So she's given to Epimetheus, who who can't believe his good luck. He's smitten. And because he doesn't have a lot of foresight, <laughs> he just says, yes, absolutely. She's amazing. Let's, you know, I'd be happy to have her. And so they're in this bit of bliss. And after a while, Pandora, having the gift of curiosity, as Oppenheimer did, and perhaps as the progenitors of artificial intelligence do, she opens the box, and every ill, every character flaw, every disease, every misfortune zooms out of the box, and Pandora can see this somehow, which I find very interesting, mm-hmm. because she's, she's stunned with this um, rushing river of misfortune, and uh, in the last second, she closes the lid, you know, panting, uh, thinking maybe she's kind of stopped the flood of terrible things from happening. Epimetheus, who only learns things in hindsight, is the perfect person to be standing there with the woman that he loves, uh-huh. looking at her, adoring her, being rather impulsive, not having a care for the future. But it's only in hindsight that Epimetheus is like, ah, damn, we should have buried that box. I don't know what we were thinking, keeping that around the house. But, you know, the cat's out of the bag. Interestingly, um, Pandora discovers that there is one intelligence left in the box. Ah. And the intelligence is hope. Now, I'd like to... um, put something perhaps a little more pessimistic into the room because 
All the ills and ailments that got let out of the box isn't pessimistic enough? Well, I think (laughs) that um, people have this, people um, put this romantic fantasy that one of the gods must have really liked humanity and put one good thing in the box called hope. Ah. Because if she opens the box, and she does, and lets hope out, then at least human Ah. beings in the midst of their suffering can be buoyed up by hope. But what I'd like to suggest is hope may very well be one of the evils. Because uh, Oppenheimer's putting all this together and he hopes that it'll be put to really good use and that all the wars that will implement these atomic weapons will wind up being just wars. And he's very hopeful about that. And People are very hopeful about artificial intelligence, which could develop all of these remarkable capacities. Mm-hmm. And, you know, hope is the luxury of Epimetheus, who learns in hindsight. Hope is the seduction mm-hmm. that we'll just put all this stuff together, stick it under the lightning, see if it lights up and comes to life, and we'll just be hopeful that it's going to be this amazing human oh. being. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put these genetic things together and create mm-hmm. some new corn. And we'll just be hopeful that it's going to be nutritious and everyone is going to love it. And we'll just hope that it's not going to give people horrible digestive diseases because no one knows how to digest that molecule. That hope is often that terrible little nudge into the unwise action. That thing that says, well, let's just put all the money on the table for the next roulette wheel and let's just hope that we'll win, you know, because we've lost almost everything already. So one could make, one could be very ambivalent about hope, but Pandora has to make sure mm-hmm. that all the evils let out. <laughs> so there's the prophetic view of Prometheus that kind of knows that something's going to have to be sacrificed to give fire to humanity. And then there's Epimetheus, who's just hopeful everything's going to be great, and then releases this untold ills Mm. upon humanity, because it all looked so good at the beginning. Well, you know, I have another um, uh, recollection here in that book that I had as a child. Uh, pan, there was an illustration of Pandora opening the box, and all the ills and ailments were uh, imaged as insects. Mm. And so this swarm of insects was flying out of the box while Pandora's mouth, she's kind of agape, like, oh, what happened here? Um, and it was portrayed as a good thing uh, that fortunately there's still hope so I would like to um, uh, go back to my uh, theme running through today of ambiguity, that I agree with you that hope can be fruitless and uh, naive and uh, really come to no good, uh, and it can keep us going against all odds. You know, um, what pops into my mind is Nelson Mandela, who was Mm -hmm. imprisoned on Robben Island for 27 years. Yeah. And I I imagine he somehow kept hope alive, that somehow, some way, that obviously he could not effect, that somehow uh, something would change Justice would be done, and uh, by God, his hope was rewarded. Um, And he was not in good health, uh, understandably. But um, again, it comes to, you know, how do we use it? What, how much consciousness uh, can we bring? You know, if I hope that the sun will rise in the West. It's it's not going to happen. How much 
insight do I have? Have I done any little research about how the sun works? You know, no, I haven't. It's not an informed, consciously held hope. Um, but for somebody like Nelson Mandela, uh, it may fuel the life spark and the will to hold on uh, in service of something greater. And, and I understand that, and I think many of us of course in, in our darkness um, have mm -hmm. some internal image that we're clinging to, whether it's a religious yeah. image or or some some sense that there will be a future beyond the suffering yeah. that we have yeah. in the moment. Yeah. No, but your point is so well taken. Hope in its darker or negative aspect is just denial or naivete. Right. Well, and let's we just all throw know the that the gods, the, go yeah. the gods love to punish naivete and innocence. Right. But in uh, in its positive aspect, um, it it is inspiring, or it can be inspiring. The juxtaposition uh, that I'd like to offer is um, that if if we were to entertain that the word hope, in the way that Pandora and Epimetheus seem to be demonstrating it, that the correction would be foresight, intuition, and intentionality. That Prometheus, as a god of prophecy, is thinking about what is likely possible as things continue to unfold. That mm -hmm. intuition those of us who are intuitive types, we're gathering data, we're gathering data, and we have an, a sense of potential. And once we have a sense of the potential in a person, in a situation, in any number of ways, there's a sense that there's an emerging process, there's an emerging thing here. And if I keep the emergent possibility in mm -hmm. vision, that there is something that's given to us. There's there's something to relate to, and we can fall in love with a perceived potential which is not present yes, in the given do. moment. So I think that Prometheus's prophetic vision foresaw that there would be suffering involved in this. It can still, one could say, well, he's hoping that this potential is going to happen, so maybe that's hope. But I think as intuitive types, it's not the same thing as hope. It, to legitimately perceive mm -hmm. the potential of something feels quite real. It doesn't feel mm -hmm. like gambling. Mm -hmm. Whether or not the situation, the conditions will all come together to actualize the hope, I mean, that depends on lots of things, some of which we can control, some not. But I think of hope as as a kind of audacious gambling energy <laughs> that um, we don't, we have no idea what's in front of us. If we think from Epimetheus' standpoint, we have no idea where any of this is going. But listen, what we're leaving behind is kind of crummy. So let's just, you know, go ahead, give me, give me a shot. So intention and true yeah. emergent potential. Is, is a way to perhaps yeah. step away from blind hope towards something that is being informed by something or other. Yeah. Well, um, I, I'm still going to hold on to hope. And um, <laughs> of course, I, I hope that as we keep talking, you'll see this differently. <laughs> I can't resist we'll that. We'll keep talking for a long time, uh, I have no doubt. But <laughs> it's But I like... I like uh, uh, having it veer into intuition, which which is a realistic uh, potential of, that I can make this happen, and and the intention, but th of I'm going to apply myself, and if I'm Victor Frankenstein, I have the intuition and the foresight that I can create. Life and uh, he had the knowledge base mm -hmm. and the intention, and he worked at it, 
and he made it happen. Um, but where I'm going here is, you know, the creature was unhappy and wreaked havoc and had havoc wreaked on him. Of uh, Back to the Greeks and uh, some of the inscriptions on the, uh, the temple at Delphi of nothing in excess. And when do we know that it's excessive? Uh, like, you know, to my mind, to use your example of you know, take your last dollars and bet them all on a turn of the roulette wheel seems at the very least excessive. And the other that I can recall from that temple is to know thyself, mm -hmm. which uh, from a Jungian point of view is, you know, are you really making a conscious decision? Or uh, the, the, one of the terrible sins for the Greeks was hubris, to, to arrogate to oneself uh, the powers of the gods, that you must remember, you, all of us, must remember you are mortal, uh, and we cannot be inflated and arrogant and become too godlike. We have to remain conscious of who we are and what our limitations are. And, uh, you know, Mary Shelley's story is just a, a great example of Promethean power, and there it is in the title of her story. Yeah. And I have to wonder, I have to wonder today, have mm -hmm. we arrogated to ourselves uh, too much inappropriate hubris and and power. Uh, what are we doing? And all we have to do is look around. Uh, we, we can look at uh, leaders, political situations, areas where there are wars, scientific quote-unquote advances, and just wonder about... Uh, have we become Promethean? And I, I don't know that Prometheus knew what would befall him. Um, or whether it just happened to him afterwards that he was punished. But uh, that we need to have the kind of foresight and afterthought uh, that the two Greek mythological characters we're discussing didn't really have. Right, and those two qualities are both in human beings, forethought and mm -hmm. hindsight. There's yeah. perhaps one hopeful bit, is that... You use the word hopeful, Joseph. Exactly. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> that... Prometheus is bound to this, the Caucasus Mountains, actually, this mm -hmm. mighty eagle. Eagles are associated with Zeus. An emissary yes. of Zeus comes and eats the liver out, and he's screaming, and it grows back at night, and it happens again and again. <sighs> and then something miraculous happens at some untold future, is that the hero Hercules, who is a demigod, he is a son of Zeus, but born of a woman, that he is both uh -huh. divine and human, mm -hmm. has transgressed, and he has set before him 12 labors that he must perform in order to redeem himself. Mm -hmm. And while he is in route to do one mm -hmm. of these labors, he comes upon Prometheus in this ah. agony. And... Hercules feels compassion for the suffering oh. of Prometheus, which I think is very important. He shoots mm -hmm. the eagle with one of his arrows and ends Prometheus's torment. And so one lens could be that there is a reconciliation between human ambition represented by Prometheus and divine authority 
which is represented by mm -hmm. Zeus, that these two forces could be mediated, reconciled by a hero who straddles mm -hmm. both realms. Mm -hmm. And the key to resolving this is compassion for suffering. Mm -hmm. and, and when we think about Oppenheimer and the whole team creating this frightening weapon. Where was Hercules talking about feeling compassion for suffering? And so learning from that, mm -hmm. as we're creating all kinds of remarkable new things, yes, maybe this will relieve suffering, Maybe it'll visit terrible things upon humanity. But the attitude that reconciles all of this is compassion. That that's the question. Is artificial intelligence in all its expansion aligned mm -hmm. with compassion? And is there an I? to suffering that may be alleviated and suffering that may be created by this. And if those possibilities are held in compassion, then like Hercules, a decision might be made that is perhaps corrective or temperate or somehow has a foot in the archetypal and the human mm -hmm. so that we don't lose sight of vulnerability. Well, that brings us uh, to a very hopeful note of uh, heroes combine the divine and the human, and that that is, maybe that's our mission, and that the hallmark of that is compassion. So we can intend compassion. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall we transition to a dream? Let's do that. Okay. So... Maybe it's time for us to shift to a dream. Okay. A dreamer is a 41-year-old male, and he works as a technology attorney. And here is his dream. A likable, completely bald old man was near the end of his life and fading into obscurity. So he gave me his eagle, he taught me how to care for it and what to do with it. The eagle came near me. It was on my arm at times. I sat listening to the old man for a while. Then he said, Of course, this isn't everything you need to know, but this is all I can teach you. For the rest, you'll have to learn from the old man who taught me. Ah. For context, he says, I'm about to move overseas with my girlfriend of two years, and we are trying to envision a longer-term future together. He says the main feelings were honored to be entrusted with the eagle by the old man and to be accepted by the eagle itself, a sense of responsibility, and he felt happy. He offers a little bit more explanation. My girlfriend and I have been pursuing bird watching as a hobby since we met. The night before the dream, we had been perusing bird books together after seeing two robins fighting over mating territory. One of the books noted that birds of prey are predators of small birds such as robins. Mm -hmm. I'm just noting that my first feeling in hearing this dream uh, 
was a bodily reaction, smiling. Ah. Oh. The dream has made me smile. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I highlight that because I just, you know, um, for listeners, have noticed how you feel when you first hear, hear a dream or any anything else that happens in life. Of Your body will tell you. You'll have a, a physical reaction. And um, and that can be a way a way in mm. of what that first physical emotional response is matters. So so that sounds great um, to work with that as um, mm -hmm. as also an example for the listeners. So Deb, starting mm. with that feeling of smiling, mm. how how do you take the next step into the dream through the smile? Uh, where I think about, uh, I always think about the first uh, part of the dream and the setting, and because that is the psychic situation. Mm -hmm. The dreams usually start you out with, here's where you are inside in your life, and then they depict it as, you know, I was walking on the beach, or um, I was uh, in a building where there was this strong smell of smoke, we, we kind of intuitively get it. And this dream starts with a likable, completely bald old man was near the end of his life. And he gives our, our dreamer, the dream ego, a legacy. Mm -hmm. But the first part of the dream is a likable, completely bald old man is starting to fade. So some inner old man something of uh, the previous generation, uh, maybe a parental complex, mm -hmm. is ending and passes on a legacy of what we all do. We uh, pass on our eagle, <laughs> we mm -hmm. hope. Isn't yes. that nice? And eagles are Zeus's birds, and mm -hmm. Zeus was the head of... Uh, Mount Olympus, he was the head of the gods, and the eagle was Zeus's bird. And, of course, it's uh, an American symbol, the symbol of our, our country. Uh, so here, there's a smiling situation of, here's a legacy for you, an eagle. So while the man is fading toward the end of life and it's interesting, he's fading into obscurity. I think that's an interesting juxtaposition. It's, it's not just that the end of his life, but that he is, he's moving into a hidden state. When something is obscured, it's falling out of knowledge, falling out of memory, mm -hmm. that it can no longer be accessed so easily. And the inclusion of that word psychologizes the inner death process mm -hmm. because often in people's dreams when a character seems to die we often interpret it as falling out of consciousness or falling mm -hmm. into a depth of the unconscious that it may be very difficult to access mm -hmm. and perhaps maybe not possible to access at all again but its life continues in this perhaps secret place. Um, I'm also really struck by the fact that the dreamer wants us to know that he's not just bald, but he is completely bald. Oh, that's okay. What do you make of that? That's you're, that, you're right. That's a specific detail right. uh, that is worth taking a second look at. For me, when I, <laughs> I used to be a medical social worker in a burn trauma unit. And so um, I was not too frequently, but sometimes there in the end of life. And depending on the illness or what had happened, when someone had lost all of their hair, mm -hmm. it made them seem um, like babies. It, it was as if they had been returned to an mm -hmm. infancy. Um, just the way some babies are born and they're just, they don't have any hair. And there's something so profoundly vulnerable 
about being an adult who has lost all of their hair? I, I'm also looking at the flip side, and I think your your point is really well taken for a very old man mm. who who is dying. And yet I also think about um, it's a symbol of sort of potent masculinity of all kinds of TV stars and actors and films shave their heads so they're completely bald. It's like, I don't need hair because I've got the juice. It's interesting that uh, somewhat younger men will lose their hair really who have the very high levels of testosterone because it... Um, the testosterone thickens the skin to the point where the uh, hair follicles begin to ah. lose blood flow. So there's a relationship between <laughs> high levels of testosterone and uh, loss of head hair. Um, so you're, you're quite right. Yeah. And also, as we may have seen people towards the end of life, uh, as metabolic processes begin to recede, um, men will lose the hair on their legs and hair on all of their body will begin to reduce dramatically mm -hmm. as a shift of uh, metabolism. But I take your meaning that mm -hmm. the baldness could be um, a symbol of potency. It could also be a symbol that the life force has withdrawn from the surface of the skin. Yeah. And yeah. So things are not maintenanced there. But I like the, the valence I also, it's important that he's likable. He might be near the end of his <laughs> life and that the dream ego senses that, but that the old man is still vital. He's vital enough to be likable and relational and be able yes. to tell interesting stories. Yeah, and he's giving. Yes. He gave me his eagle. He mm -hmm. taught me how to care for it, what to do with it. And then the eagle accepts the transfer and comes near our dream ego, and it's it's on his arm at times. So there's something here about passing something on, passing, passing the baton. And uh, we've read it a million times about you know people who say, "Oh, this is the watch that was my father's or it was mm -hmm. my grandfather's." Uh, uh, something being passed down from generation to generation. And in this case, it's an eagle. Yes, that brings up the idea of the lineage, because there's a sense mm -hmm. that the old man who taught him how to care for the eagle, there's an implication that this eagle it perhaps is um, a metaphysical eagle. This is an eagle that lives forever, mm -hmm. that got passed from oh, an old right. man to this man, and then... <laughs> He lived 90 years, and the eagle is still alive, and it gets passed to a young man, and then <laughs> ostensibly passed uh, further yeah. again. So, which I think you evoked with thinking of the eagle as connected to Zeus, that the eagle is um, is a mythic eagle. It's a spiritual eagle that stays alive mm. and vital, even though its caretakers fade um, lifetime after lifetime. So I, I am thinking about that and uh, takes us into, you know, what is an eagle yeah. as a symbol of a particular kind of, <clears throat> of life force? And I have to um, add a personal anecdote that um, while we're, we're here wintering in Florida, uh, there is an eagle who flies by the window every afternoon. And it is riveting. And there are other birds that fly by, of course, or especially pelicans. But that eagle with its white head and its white tail and its wingspan makes my breath stop every time it flies by. And I'm, I'm looking out the window and working on Zoom, and I'm facing the window. Mm -hmm. And when that eagle flies by, I, I look away from the screen for a moment. So this is a powerful dream image of to be given an eagle. 
They and I, sometimes I can e- see its talons. Uh, and I have also seen an eagle catch another bird in flight. Well, that must have been amazing. Uh, it just dives and snatched this kind of nondescript mm. black bird. I'm not a, a birder. Mm. Uh, and that, too, is a breath-stopping moment. So they're not cute, right, they're adorable predators, alpha predators, little birds. Really. Yes. Mm-hmm. They're also huge. Um, huge. Well, I have, you don't, I, I, I didn't appreciate how uh, big it North is. Carolina. Yes. Oh. Down in North Carolina, we have eagles, and you have to watch your pets. Like, um, oh. you know, people that have small dogs, they, they'll get carried off. So it's, oh. it's I mean, it's, not, it's funny and not so funny, but um, uh, it's, yeah, it's real. I get it. it's, you know, that stuff is real. So he's got a powerful uh, legacy to pass on of uh, being kind of king of the birds. Right. And a certain ruthlessness that eagles have. They are birds of prey. They're predators. Right. So if we look at the context, I'm trying to weave it together, that he is about to move overseas with his girlfriend of about two years, and they are beginning to plan a future, to envision a long-term future together. So it sounds like uh, two important things are occurring. Um, when he says overseas, I guess the implication is that he's in the United States. Mm-hmm. He's going to go over to Europe, perhaps, um, to relocate from the United States to, let's say, some European area is an enormous mm-hmm. undertaking. Um, there's a lot of implications. Um, and a huge translation into a different culture, uh, a different archetypal dynamism, in some ways into a more ancient culture, for sure, and that something is being passed on to him that ostensibly he will need to pass on, that he is going to carry with him into this, what I think of as a, a journey, a journey to a new land. Mm-hmm. He's also considering, I would imagine, having a, a kind of permanent relationship with this, with this girl, with a spouse, mm-hmm. and the journey of choosing uh, to have a committed, stable, long-term relationship, perhaps a marriage. That's that's another really substantive journey, you know, across open water, and that the ancient masculine, the ancestors, passing something to him from the grandfather, to the, from the great-grandfather, to the father, to him, and then perhaps on from him, that he is participating in a, an ancestral lineage, both of immigrating perhaps to the new land and also considering a permanent relationship with a spouse that could in, mm-hmm. include, let's say, a son or a daughter who he would pass mm-hmm. the eagle onto as well. Yeah. So the eagle is a spirit. As you were saying, it's a, a spirit of um, instinctive dynamism. It's a spirit of power. It's uh, a spirit, in as Americans, it's a spirit of... Mm-hmm. Uh, democracy and freedom and dynamism and uh, authority. And the sense is, it is, while he says that he's giving him his eagle, which I'm not sure, if if, if it was my own Alessand, I'd kind mm-hmm. of ask, has the eagle really become your property? Or have you become you know, the caretaker of the of the spirit, uh, that, the eagle that never <laughs> dies. But that's going to have to get sorted out in his mind, right? Yes. I think that is a really important point of uh, if we had him in the room of what, how do you envision your relationship with this eagle? Right. Uh, because there can be an inflationary aspect around a symbol like this. 
of like, okay, now I have the eagle and it's mine. Yeah. Uh, versus something has been passed on to me that I am the steward of, uh, that I care for it mm-hmm. uh, and have a respectful relationship with it. Uh, but I'm not identified with, um, oh, good, now I have ego spirit and ego power. Uh, once we arrogate that kind of archetypal force to ourselves, uh, it, it can really be inflating. Uh, but I, I don't read it that way, actually, uh, from the context. It feels like the dreamer is making a big life transition toward a permanent relationship uh, and establishing a new home, you know, literally in a new place, a new land, uh, and moving into the future, at which point this old man in him Mm -hmm. uh, passes the eagle on. And that tasks him with with reaching back further into time or antiquity because there's more to learn about the eagle than this man either has time or capacity to teach so that he will need to reach back to the mentor who Mm -hmm. taught him. Mm -hmm. You know, in spiritual traditions, the lineage (laughs) is often very, very important. You know, in the Far East, uh, the gurus... Um, and their disciples, and their disciples' disciples. There is, there is thought to be a kind of literal spirit, mm-hmm. the spirit of the teachings, perhaps even a living spirit that is passed yeah. uh, from the master to the student. And some believe it is, it, it is really a literal, somewhat supernatural power that is surrendered and this carries some of that quality to it. Yes, it does. And it takes me to uh, the collective unconscious, uh, the deep, deep layer of the unconscious that Jung dis- discovered that he believed uh, was uh, sort of like our genetic traits that evolved over eons, that um, we carry the past with us. And, and that so it is with our psychic history as well, that that is passed on. And uh, so there's a kind of phylogenetic uh, memory uh, mm. that, that we carry, and our dreamer in this context uh, has access uh, to previous generations, to instinctual, inherited, deeply human uh, wisdom about old men and the masculine, and that that is that is in him, uh, like what you were talking about, Joseph, like you know the lineage of gurus mm-hmm. that we can reach back generations uh, that we have access to stored human experience mm-hmm. uh, and he can learn that our dreamer can learn that from the old man. Uh, who taught the man who is passing on the eagle. It's really lovely. It's, it's a huge lovely. connection. If I step way, way back, and because <laughs> the images are so delightful, I can keep staring at the eagle. But I, I'm stepping back. If I were to take all of, so much of the material and set it aside and ask, what does the ego not know at the beginning and what mm-hmm. does he know more about at the end of this brief dream? And he is being taught how to care for something. Mm. And he is he, embarking he's... on a journey with a loved one yeah. to have a new life in a new place. And so the unconscious is, of, is also saying, there, there are new and surprising objects, inner objects, outer objects, loved ones, and you need to learn how to care for them, how to tend them, yeah, 
and and what to do with them, which is a, again a, a broad enigmatic statement, but how to exercise them, how to care for them, how to be in relationship to them. And I'm mm-hmm. wondering if the idea of the long-term future with the relationship, that the relationship could be seen as the eagle as well. It's a bit of a mm. stretch, but you know, yeah. the idea of being in relationship, in a marriage, and how what is the care and tending and the doing of the relationship that he's going to carry mm-hmm. into this and, next stage of his life. And he can learn from the old man within him. Exactly. That he, he, uh, he has that inside himself. And that the tending, the capacity to care, stretches back into antiquity. And there is something inside of us genetically and instinctively that if we are paying attention to it, is talking to us about how to be in relationship, how to be with the other in our lives. Mm-hmm. I'm going to I'm going to verbalize a bias, and I apologize mm-hmm. to the attorneys in the world. But uh, <laughs> having having known many attorneys in my life, mm-hmm. um, whether it's mm-hmm. a, a certain type of a person is attracted to law, or that the practice of being an attorney requires you to develop a certain kind of personality. But often there is um, uh, a removal of um, feeling. People have to be very objective. They have to be very strategic. Often an attorney has to be very aggressive. There's a lot Mm -hmm. about winning the debate, winning your side of it, winning for your clients, uh, harvesting all this forensic information to be right and to get what you need and defeat the other side of it. I mean... It's, uh, I can understand how exciting that is to be an attorney, and whether it's contract work or um, work that's being done in the courtroom, it's still that same spirit um, of the mm-hmm. war of words and the power of words, as well as harnessed aggression. Consequently, um, when, when the attorneys of the world go according, <laughs> um, there's there's a whole other side of the relational world that isn't about being right and isn't yeah. about winning and isn't about being the smartest or finding the chink in what's wrong with the argument, but is about how to care and how to tend and how to be sensitive <laughs> and nurture and feed uh, and house something. You know, you're not gonna, it's not a legal argument with the eagle. You know, it's not gonna argue with you. You just have to learn what the eagle needs. And also, by the way, animals are not as adaptive as human beings. So human beings who care for animals need to learn what the animal needs and supply it, or lest the animal die. So the human has to sublimate whatever its fantasies are and its own priorities to make sure that the creature, the creatures that are under its care get what they need yeah. because they're now dependent. Yeah. So it may be this dream is about balancing uh, the aggressive uh, eagle power uh, you know, and as you say, attorneys harness aggression to argue their case in court, and that's mm-hmm. what it's often called. And I'm aware that this dream uh, was had by the dreamer uh, the the night bef- uh, after having seen two robins fighting over mating territory, and that one of their bird books noted birds of prey are predators of small birds such as robins. So uh, what you're saying of how to tend, how to attend to what the animal nature, his instinctual nature needs uh, versus um, 
being a predator. Uh, how do you balance those things? How do you harness your aggression, your assertiveness, and the ability to be a leader? Um, it's, uh, Zeus was the head of the pantheon of gods, and he was also very aggressive and sometimes very lawless uh, in his uh, decrees and punishments and pursuits. Mm-hmm. And how to how, how do you how do you tend to and how do you use ego power wisely? Well, the dream says um, that's okay. Uh, he has an inner old man uh, who can teach him. And there's more to learn. That's, that's more the always message. more. Here's yes. the ego. Here's the basic instruc- instructions. I'm fading into obscurity. But uh, go down the road a couple of miles and talk to my teacher because you're just beginning to learn what's required to Mm -hmm. be the keeper of the eagle, to be the high priest of the eagle. The last bit I want to say is that in Western astrology, the eagle and the Scorpio are both assigned to the astrologic sign of Scorpio. And there is a, a progression that the lower Scorpio energy, which is said to be the sexual forces, um, often in the, the spiritual traditions are thought to have a sting to them, that being hmm. purely sexually driven, without regard for any philosophic frame, can leave us like two fighting robins. You know, the the idea of territory and mating and uh, the lower instinctive energies of reproduction and the fight for reproduction. But many spiritual traditions claim that the creativity of the sexual force can also be turned to higher aims. Mm. Freud wrote about this in terms of sublimation, that the sexual force he attributed to sports, civilization, art, that the sexual libido could be and was in fact redirected to all kinds of other aims. And in the symbolic system, the Scorpio becomes the eagle. And the Mm. eagle is able to soar, fueled by the creative and even reproductive dynamism of the sexuality. So the eagle Mm -hmm. could represent something very new that is happening at 41 Mm -hmm. with reproducing a life, reproducing or begetting oneself upon the earth, which is a way of thinking about bringing forward other kinds of children, a vision for a new life in Europe, the book that you want to write the new things that require desire, creativity, and passion in order to bring forward. Mm -hmm. And the eagle in astrology is a sign of that higher application Mm -hmm. of the creative forces. I think in the end, Deb, you and I just both think the dreams is really positive Mm -hmm. in all the various ways. Yeah, yeah. I want to wish him well. <laughs> oh, I, I, th- I hope we hear from him after he lands in Europe because it sounds be like great. he's going to have a great experience. Yeah. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.